November 11th. I was right, quite right in my idea. I have found... Oh, joy! I treated the vice-prefect's son to a dinner of five courses at the Trattoria La Stella d'Italia out of sheer jubilation. I have found in the archives, unknown, of course, to the director, a heap of letters. Letters of Duke Robert about Medea da Carpi. Letters of Medea herself. Yes, Medea's own handwriting. A round, scholarly character, full of abbreviations, with a Greek look about it, as befits a learned princess who could read Plato as well as Petrarch. The letters are of little importance, mere drafts of business letters for her secretary to copy during the time that she governed the poor, weak Guidalfonso. But they are her letters, and I can imagine almost that there hangs about these mouldering pieces of paper a scent, as of a woman's hair. The few letters of Duke Robert show him in a new light a cunning, cold, but craven priest. He trembles at the bare thought of Medea, la pessima Medea, worse than her namesake of Colchis, as he calls her. His long clemency is a result of mere fear of laying violent hands upon her. He fears her as something almost supernatural. He would have enjoyed having had her burned as a witch. After letter on letter, telling his crony, Cardinal San Severino, at Rome, his various precautions during her lifetime, how he wears a jacket of mail under his coat, how he drinks only milk from a cow, which he has milked in his presence, how he tries his dog with morsels of his food lest it be poisoned, how he suspects the wax candles because of their peculiar smell, how he fears riding out lest someone should frighten his horse and cause him to break his neck. After all this, and when Medea has been in her grave two years, he tells his correspondent of his fear of meeting the soul of Medea after his own death, and chuckles over the ingenious device, concocted by his astrologer and a certain Frau Gaudenzio, a capuchin, by which he shall secure the absolute peace of his soul, until that of the wicked Medea be finally chained up in hell among the lakes of boiling pitch and the ice of Caina described by the immortal bard. Old pedant! Here, then, is the explanation of that silver image, quod vulgo dicito idolino, which he caused to be soldered into his effigy by Tassi, as long as the image of his soul was attached to the image of his body, he should sleep, awaiting the day of judgment, fully convinced that Medea's soul will then be properly tarred and feathered, while his, honest man, will fly straight to paradise. And to think that two weeks ago I believed this man to be a hero! Aha, my good Duke Robert, you shall be shown up in my history." and no amount of silver idolinos shall save you from being heartily laughed at. November 15th. Strange. That idiot of a prefect's son, who has heard me talk a hundred times of Medea de Carpi, suddenly recollects that, when he was a child at Urbania, his nurse used to threaten him with a visit from Madonna Medea, who rode in the sky on a black he-goat, my Duchess Medea turned into a bogey for naughty little boys. November 20th I have been going about with the Bavarian professor of medieval history, showing him all over the country. Among other places we went to Rocca St. Elmo, to see the former villa of the Dukes of Urbania, the villa where Medea was confined between the accession of Duke Robert and the conspiracy of Marcantonio Frangipani, which caused her removal to the nunnery immediately outside the town. A long ride up the desolate Apennine valleys, bleak beyond words just now with their thin fringe of oak scrub turned russet, thin patches of grass seared by the frost, the last few yellow leaves of the poplars by the torrents shaking and fluttering about in the chill tramontana. The mountain tops are wrapped in thick grey cloud. Tomorrow, if the wind continues, we shall see them round masses of snow against the cold blue sky. St. Elmo is a wretched hamlet high on the Apennine Ridge, where the Italian vegetation is already replaced by that of the north. You ride for miles through leafless chestnut woods, 
the scent of the soaking brown leaves filling the air, the roar of the torrent, turbid with autumn rains, rising from the precipice below. Then suddenly the leafless chestnut woods are replaced, as at Vallombrosa, by a belt of black, dense fir plantations. Emerging from these, you come to an open space, frozen, blasted meadows, the rocks of snow-clad peak, the newly fallen snow, close above you, and in the midst, on a knoll, with a gnarled larch on either side, the ducal villa of St. Elmo, a big black stone box with a stone escutcheon, grated windows, and a double flight of steps in front. It is now let out to the proprietor of the neighbouring woods, who uses it for the storage of chestnuts, faggots, and charcoal from the neighbouring ovens. We tied our horses to the iron rings and entered. An old woman with dishevelled hair was alone in the house. The villa is a mere hunting lodge, built by Otto Borna IV, the father of Dukes Guidalfonso and Robert, about 1530. Some of the rooms have at one time been frescoed and panelled with oak carvings, but all this has disappeared. Only, in one of the big rooms, there remains a large marble fireplace, similar to those in the palace at Urbania, beautifully carved with cupids on a blue ground. A charming naked boy sustains a jar on either side, one containing clove pinks, the other roses. The room was filled with stacks of faggots. We returned home late, my companion in excessively bad humour at the fruitlessness of the expedition. We were caught in the skirt of a snowstorm as we got into the chestnut woods. The sight of the snow falling gently, of the earth and bushes whitened all round, made me feel back at Posen, once more a child. I sang and shouted, to my companion's horror, "'This will be a bad point against me if reported at Berlin. "'A historian of twenty-four who shouts and sings, "'and that when another historian is cursing at the snow and the bad roads. "'All night I lay awake watching the embers of my wood fire "'and thinking of Medea da Carpi, mewed up in winter, "'in that solitude of St. Elmo, the firs groaning, the torrent roaring, the snow falling all round, miles and miles away from human creatures. I fancied I saw it all, and that I, somehow, was Marc Antonio Frangipani come to liberate her, or was it Principali degli Odellaffi? I suppose it was because of the long ride, the unaccustomed pricking feeling of the snow in the air or perhaps the punch which my professor insisted on drinking after dinner. November 23rd Thank goodness that Bavarian professor has finally departed. Those days he spent here drove me nearly crazy. Talking over my work, I told him one day my views on Medea da Carpi, whereupon he condescended to answer that those were the usual tales, due to the mythopoeic, old idiot, tendency of the Renaissance, that research would disprove the greater part of them, as it had disproved the stories current about the Borgias, etc., that, moreover, such a woman as I made out was psychologically and physiologically impossible. Would that one could say as much of such professors as he and his fellows. November 24th I cannot get over my pleasure in being rid of that imbecile. I felt as if I could have throttled him every time he spoke of the lady of my thoughts, for such she has become. Metia, as the animal called her. November 30th. I feel quite shaken at what has just happened. I am beginning to fear that the old pedant was right in saying that it was bad for me to live all alone in a strange country, that it would make me morbid. It is ridiculous that I should be put into such a state of excitement merely by the chance discovery of a portrait of a woman dead these three hundred years. With the case of my uncle Ladislas, and other suspicions of insanity in my family, I ought really to guard against such foolish excitement. 
yet the incident was really dramatic, uncanny. I could have sworn that I knew every picture in the palace here, and particularly every picture of her. Anyhow, this morning, as I was leaving the archives, I passed through one of the many small rooms, irregular-shaped closets, which filled up the ins and outs of this curious palace, turreted like a French chateau. I must have passed through that closet before, for the view was so familiar out of its window, just the particular bit of round tower in front, the cypress on the other side of the ravine, the belfry beyond, and the piece of the line of Monte St. Agata, and the Leonessa, covered with snow against the sky. I suppose there must be twin rooms, and that I had got into the wrong one, or rather, perhaps some shutter had been opened or curtain withdrawn. As I was passing, my eye was caught by a very beautiful old mirror frame let into the brown and yellow inlaid wall. I approached and, looking at the frame, looked also mechanically into the glass. I gave a great start and almost shrieked, I do believe. It's lucky the Munich professor is safe out of Urbania. Behind my own image stood another, a figure close to my shoulder, a face close to mine. And that figure, that face, hers, Medea da Carpi's. I turned sharp round, as white, I think, as the ghost I expected to see. On the wall opposite the mirror, just a pace or two behind where I had been standing, hung a portrait. And such a portrait, Bronzino never painted a grander one. Against a background of harsh, dark blue, there stands out the figure of the Duchess. For it is Medea, the real Medea, a thousand times more real, individual, and powerful than in the other portraits. Seated stiffly in a high-backed chair, sustained, as it were, almost rigid, by the stiff brocade of skirts and stomacher, stiffer for plucks of embroidered silver flowers and rows of seed-pearl. The dress is, with its mixture of silver and pearl, a strange, dull red, a wicked poppy-juice colour, against which the flesh of the long, narrow hands with fringe-like fingers, of the long, slender neck, and the face with bared forehead, looks white and hard like alabaster. The face is the same as in the other portraits, the same rounded forehead, with the short, fleece-like, yellowish-red curls, the same beautifully curved eyebrows just barely marked, the same eyelids, a little tight across the eyes, the same lips, a little tight across the mouth, but with a purity of line, a dazzling splendour of skin, and intensity of look immeasurably superior to all the other portraits. She looks out of the frame with a cold, level glance, yet the lips smile. One hand holds a dull red rose, the other long, narrow, tapering, plays with a thick rope of silk and gold jewels hanging from the waist. Round the throat, white as marble, partially confined in the tight, dull red bodice, hangs a gold collar, with the device on alternate enamelled medallions. Amor dure, dure amour. On reflection, I see that I simply could never have been in that room or closet before. I must have mistaken the door. But although the explanation is so simple, I still after several hours feel terribly shaken in all my being. If I grow so excitable, I shall have to go to Rome at Christmas for a holiday. I feel as if some danger pursued me here. Can it be fever? And yet— and yet I don't see how I shall ever tear myself away. December 10th I have made an effort, and accepted the vice-prefect's son's invitation to see the oil-making at a villa of theirs near the coast. The villa, or farm, is an old fortified towered place, standing on a hillside among olive-trees and little osier bushes, which look like a bright orange flame. The olives are squeezed in a tremendous black cellar, like a prison. You see, by the faint white daylight and the smoky yellow flare of resin burning in pans, 
great white bullocks moving round a huge millstone, vague figures working at pulleys and handles. It looks, to my fancy, like some scene of the Inquisition. The Cavaliere regaled me with his best wine and rusks. I took some long walks by the seaside. I had left Urbania wrapped in snow clouds. Down on the coast there was a bright sun. The sunshine, the sea, the bustle of the little port on the Adriatic seemed to do me good. I came back to Urbania another man. Saw Asdrubali, my landlord, poking about in slippers among the gilded chests, the empire sofas, the old cups and saucers and pictures which no one will buy, congratulated me upon the improvement in my looks. "'You work too much,' he says. "'Youth requires amusement, theatres, promenades, amori. It is time enough to be serious when one is bold.' And he took off his greasy red cap. "'Yes, I am better, and as a result I take to my work with delight again. I will cut them out still, those wiseacres at Berlin.' December 14th I don't think I have ever felt so happy about my work. I see it all so well, that crafty, cowardly Duke Robert, that melancholy Duchess Madalena, that weak, showy, would-be chivalrous Duke Guidalfonso, and above all, the splendid figure of Medea. I feel as if I were the greatest historian of the age, and at the same time as if I were a boy of twelve. It snowed yesterday for the first time in the city, for two good hours. When it had done, I actually went into the square and taught the ragamuffins to make a snowman. No, a snow woman, and I had the fancy to call her Medea. La pessima Medea, cried one of the boys. The one who used to ride through the air on a goat. No, no, I said. She was a beautiful lady, the Duchess of Urbania, the most beautiful woman that ever lived. I made her a crown of tinsel, and taught the boys to cry, Eviva Medea! But one of them said, She is a witch! She must be burned! At which they all rushed to fetch burning faggots and tow. In a minute the yelling demons had melted her down. December 15th what a goose I am! And to think I am twenty-four and known in literature. In my long walks I have composed to a tune, I don't know what it is, which all the people are singing and whistling in the street at present. A poem in frightful Italian. Beginning, Medea, mia Dea, calling on her in the name of her various lovers. I go about humming between my teeth. Why am I not Marc Antonio, or Prince of Valle, or he of Nani, or the good Duke of Alfonso, that I might be beloved by thee, Medea, mia Dea, etc., etc.? Awful rubbish. My landlord, I think, suspects that Medea must be some lady I met while I was staying by the seaside. I am sure, Sora Serafina, Sora Lodovica, the Sora Adalgisa, the three Parcae, or Norns, as I call them, have some such notion. This afternoon at dusk, while tidying my room, Sora Lodovica said to me, How beautifully the Signorino has taken to singing! I was scarcely aware that I had been vociferating, Vieni Medea, mia Dea! while the old lady bobbed about making up my fire. I stopped. A nice reputation I shall get, I thought, and all this will somehow get to Rome, and thence to Berlin. So a Lodovica was leaning out of the window, pulling in the iron hook of the shrine lamp, which marks so as to Bali's house. As she was trimming the lamp, previous to swinging it out again, she said in her odd, prudish little way, you were wrong to stop singing, my son. She varies between calling me Signor Professore and such terms of affection as Nino, Viscera Mie, etc. 
"'You are wrong to stop singing, "'for there is a young lady there in the street "'who has actually stopped to listen to you.' "'I ran to the window. "'A woman, wrapped in a black shawl, "'was standing in an archway, "'looking up to the window. "'Hey, hey, the signor professore has admirers,' "'said Sora Ludovica. "'Medea, mia dea, I burst out as loud as I could, with the boy's pleasure in disconcerting the inquisitive passer-by. She turned suddenly round to go away, waving her hand at me, and at that moment saw a Lodovica swung the shrine-lamp back into its place. A stream of light fell across the street. I felt myself grow quite cold. The face of the woman outside was that of Medea da Carpi, what a fool I am, to be sure. Part 2 December 17th I fear that my craze about Medea da Carpi has become well known, thanks to my silly talk and idiotic songs. That vice-prefect's son, or the assistant at the archives, or perhaps some of the company at the Contessa's, is trying to play me a trick. But take care, my good ladies and gentlemen, I shall pay you out in your own coin. Imagine my feelings when, this morning, I found on my desk a folded letter addressed to me in a curious handwriting which seemed strangely familiar to me, and which, after a moment, I recognised as that of the letters of Medea da Carpi at the archives. It gave me a horrible shock. My next idea was that it must be a present from someone who knew my interest in Medea, a genuine letter of hers, on which some idiot had written my address, instead of putting it into an envelope. But it was addressed to me, written to me, no old letter, merely four lines, which ran as follows. To Spiridion, a person who knows the interest you bear her will be at the church of San Giovanni de Colato this evening at nine. Look out in the left aisle for a lady wearing a black mantle, and holding a rose. By this time I understood that I was the object of a conspiracy, the victim of a hoax. I turned the letter round and round. It was written on paper such as was made in the sixteenth century, and in an extraordinary precise imitation of Medea da Carpi's characters. Who had written it? I thought over all the possible people, on the whole, it must be the vice-prefect's son, perhaps in combination with his lady-love, the countess. They must have torn a blank page off some old letter. But that either of them should have had the ingenuity of inventing such a hoax, or the power of committing such a forgery, astounds me beyond measure. There is more in these people than I should have guessed. How pay them off? By taking no notice of the letter? dignified but dull. No, I will go. Perhaps someone will be there, and I will mystify them in their turn, or if no one is there, how I shall crow over them for their imperfectly carried out plot. Perhaps this is some folly of the Cavaliere Muzio's, to bring me into the presence of some lady whom he destines to be the flame of my future Amori. That is likely enough." and it would be too idiotic and professorial to refuse such an invitation. The lady must be worth knowing who can forge sixteenth-century letters like this, for I am sure that languid swell Muzio never could. I will go. By heaven I'll pay them back in their own coin. It is now five. How long these days are! December 18th. Am I mad? Oh, are there really ghosts? That adventure of last night has shaken me to the very depth of my soul. I went at nine as the mysterious letter had bid me. It was bitterly cold and the air full of fog and sleet. Not a shop open, not a window unshuttered, not a creature visible. The narrow black streets, precipitous between their high walls and under their lofty archways, were only the blacker for the dull light of an oil-lamp here and there, with its flickering yellow reflection on the wet flags. 
San Giovanni Decolato is a little church, or rather oratory, which I have always hitherto seen shut up, as so many churches here are shut up except on great festivals, and situated behind the ducal palace, on a sharp ascent, and forming the bifurcation of two steep paved lanes. I have passed by the place a hundred times, and scarcely noticed the little church, except for the marble high relief over the door, showing the grisly head of the Baptist in the charger, and for the iron cage close by, in which were formerly exposed the heads of criminals. The decapitated, or, as they call him here, decorated John the Baptist, being apparently the patron of axe and block. A few strides took me from my lodgings to San Giovanni Decolato. I confess I was excited. One is not twenty-four and a pole for nothing. On getting to the kind of little platform at the bifurcation of the two precipitous streets, I found, to my surprise, that the windows of the church or oratory were not lighted, and that the door was locked. So this was the precious joke that had been played upon me, to send me on a bitter, cold, sleety night to a church which was shut up and had perhaps been shut up for years. I don't know what I couldn't have done in that moment of rage. I felt inclined to break open the church door, or to go and pull the vice-prefect's son out of bed, for I felt sure that the joke was his. I determined upon the latter course, and was walking towards his door, along the black alley to the left of the church, when I was suddenly stopped by the sound of an organ close by. An organ, yes, quite plainly, and the voice of choristers, and the drone of a litany. So the church was not shut after all. I retraced my steps to the top of the lane. All was dark and incomplete silence. Suddenly there came again a faint gust of organ and voices. I listened. It clearly came from the other lane, the one on the right-hand side. Was there, perhaps, another door there? I passed beneath the archway, and descended a little way in the direction whence the sounds seemed to come. But no door, no light, only the black walls, the black wet flags, and their faint yellow reflections of flickering oil lamps. Moreover, complete silence. I stopped a minute, and then the chant rose again. This time it seemed to me most certainly from the lane I had just left. I went back. Nothing. Thus backwards and forwards, the sounds always beckoning, as it were, one way, only to beckon me back, vainly, to the other. At last I lost patience, and I felt a sort of creeping terror which only a violent action could dispel. If the mysterious sounds came... If the mysterious sounds came neither from the street to the right, nor from the street to the left, they could come only from the church. Half maddened, I rushed up the two or three steps, and prepared to wrench the door open with tremendous effort. To my amazement, it opened with the greatest ease. I entered, and the sounds of the litany met me louder than before, as I paused a moment between the outer door and the heavy leathern curtain. I raised the latter and crept in. The altar was brilliantly illuminated with tapers and garlands of chandeliers. This was evidently some evening service connected with Christmas. The nave and aisles were comparatively dark and about half full. I elbowed my way along the right aisle towards the altar. When my eyes had got accustomed to the unexpected light, I began to look round me, and with a beating heart. The idea that all this was a hoax, that I should meet merely some acquaintance of my friend the Cavaliere's, had somehow departed. I looked about. The people were all wrapped up, the men in big cloaks, the women in woolen veils and mantles. The body of the church was comparatively dark, and I could not make out anything very clearly, but it seemed to me somehow as if, under the cloaks and veils, these people were dressed in a rather extraordinary fashion. The man in front of me, I remarked, 
showed yellow stockings beneath his cloak. A woman hard by, a red bodice, laced behind with gold tags. Could these be peasants from some remote part come for the Christmas festivities, or did the inhabitants of Urbania don some old-fashioned garb in honour of Christmas? As I was wondering, my eye suddenly caught that of a woman standing in the opposite aisle, close to the altar, and in the full blaze of its lights. She was wrapped in black, but held in a very conspicuous way a red rose, an unknown luxury at this time of the year in a place like Urbania. She evidently saw me, and turning even more fully into the light, she loosened her heavy black cloak, displaying a dress of deep red, with gleams of silver and gold embroideries. She turned her face towards me. The full blaze of the chandeliers and tapers fell upon it. It was the face of Medea da Capri. I dashed across the nave, pushing people roughly aside, or rather, it seemed to me, passing through impalpable bodies. But the lady turned and walked rapidly down the aisle towards the door. I followed close upon her, but somehow I could not get up with her. Once at the curtain she turned round again. She was within a few paces of me. Yes, it was Medea, Medea herself. No mistake, no delusion, no sham. The oval face, the lips tightened over the mouth, the eyelids tight over the corner of the eyes, the exquisite alabaster complexion. She raised the curtain and glided out. I followed. The curtain alone separated me from her. I saw the wooden door swing to behind her. One step ahead of me. I tore open the door. She must be on the steps, within reach of my arm. I stood outside the church. All was empty. Merely the wet pavement and the yellow reflections in the pools. A sudden cold seized me. I could not go on. I tried to re-enter the church. It was shut. I rushed home, my hair standing on end and trembling in all my limbs, and remained for an hour like a maniac. Is it a delusion? Am I too going mad? Oh, God! God! Am I going mad? December 19th. A brilliant, sunny day. All the black snow slush has disappeared out of the town off the bushes and trees. The snow-clad mountains sparkle against the bright blue sky. A Sunday and Sunday weather. All the bells are ringing for the approach of Christmas. They are preparing for a kind of fair in the square with the colonnade, putting up booths filled with coloured cotton and woollen wear, bright shawls and kerchiefs, mirrors, ribbons, brilliant pewter lamps the whole turnout of the peddler in Winter's Tale. The pork shops are all garlanded with green and with paper flowers, the hams and cheeses stuck full of little flags and green twigs. I strolled out to see the cattle fair outside the gate, a forest of interlacing horns, an ocean of lowing and stamping, hundreds of immense white bullocks, with horns a yard long and red tassels, packed close together on the little piazza d'armi under the city walls. Bah! Why do I write this trash? What's the use of it all? While I am forcing myself to write about bells and Christmas festivities and cattle fairs, one idea goes on like a bell within me. Medea! Medea! Have I really seen her, or am I mad? Two hours later. That church of San Giovanni de Colato, so my landlord informs me, has not been made use of within the memory of man. Could it have been all a hallucination or a dream? Perhaps a dream dreamed that night. I have been out again to look at the church. There it is, at the bifurcation of the two steep lanes, with its bar-relief of the Baptist's head over the door. The door does look as if it had not been opened for years. I can see the cobwebs in the window-panes. It does look as if, as Sir Asdrubali says, only rats and spiders congregated within it. And yet, and yet, 
I have so clear a remembrance, so distinct a consciousness of it all. There was a picture of the daughter of Herodias dancing upon the altar. I remember her white turban with a scarlet tuft of feathers, and Herod's blue caftan. I remember the shape of the central chandelier. It swung round slowly, and one of the wax lights had got bent almost in two by the heat and draught. Things, all these which I may have seen elsewhere, stored unawares in my brain, and which may have come out somehow in a dream. I have heard physiologists allude to such things. I will go again. If the church be shut, why, then it must have been a dream, a vision, the result of over-excitement. I must leave at once for Rome and see doctors, for I am afraid of going mad. If... On the other hand, there is no other hand in such a case. Yet if there were, why then, I should really have seen Medea. I might see her again, speak to her. The mere thought sets my blood in a whirl, not with horror, but with, I know not what to call it. The feeling terrifies me, but it is delicious. Idiot! There is some little coil of my brain, the twentieth of a hair's breadth, out of order. That's all. December 20th I have been again. I have heard the music. I have been inside the church. I have seen her. I can no longer doubt my senses. Why should I? Those pedants say that the dead are dead. The past is past. For them, yes. But why for me? Why for a man who loves, who is consumed with the love of a woman? A woman who indeed... Yes, let me finish the sentence. Why should there not be ghosts to such as can see them? Why should she not return to the earth, if she knows that it contains a man who thinks of, desires, only her? A hallucination? Why, I saw her as I see this paper that I write upon, standing there in the full blaze of the altar. Why, I heard the rustle of her skirts, I smelled the scent of her hair, I raised the curtain which was shaking from her touch. Again I missed her, but this time, as I rushed out into the empty moonlit street, I found upon the church steps a rose, the rose which I had seen in her hand the moment before. I felt it, smelled it, a rose. A real, living rose, dark red, and only just plucked. I put it into water when I returned. After having kissed it, who knows how many times, I placed it on the top of the cupboard. I determined not to look at it for twenty-four hours, lest it should be a delusion. But I must see it again. I must. Good heavens! This is horrible! Horrible! If I had found a skeleton, it could not have been worse. The rose, which last night seemed freshly plucked, full of colour and perfume, is brown, dry. A thing kept for centuries between the leaves of a book. It has crumbled into dust between my fingers. Horrible. Horrible, but why so, pray? Did I not know that I was in love with a woman dead three hundred years? If I wanted fresh roses which bloomed yesterday, the Countess Fiametta or any little seamstress in Urbania might have given them me. What if the rose has fallen to dust? If only I could hold Medea in my arms as I held it in my fingers, kiss her lips as I kissed its petals, should I not be satisfied if she too were to fall to dust the next moment, if I were to fall to dust myself? December 22nd Eleven at night. I have seen her once more, almost spoken to her. I have been promised her love. Ah, Spiridion, you were right when you felt that you were not made for any earthly amore. At the usual hour I betook myself this evening to San Giovanni de Colato. A bright winter night. The high houses and belfries standing out against a deep blue heaven, luminous, shimmering like steel with myriads of stars. The moon has not yet risen. There was no light in the windows. 
but after a little effort the door opened and I entered the church. The altar, as usual, brilliantly illuminated. It struck me suddenly that all this crowd of men and women standing all round, these priests chanting and moving about the altar, were dead, that they did not exist for any man save me. I touched, as if by accident, the hand of my neighbour. It was cold like wet clay. He turned round, but did not seem to see me. His face was ashy, and his eyes staring, fixed, like those of a blind man or corpse. I felt as if I must rush out. But at that moment my eye fell upon her, standing as usual by the altar steps, wrapped in a black mantle, in the full blaze of the lights. She turned round, the light fell straight upon her face, the face with the delicate features, the eyelids and lips a little tight, the alabaster skin faintly tinged with pale pink. Our eyes met. I pushed my way across the nave towards where she stood by the altar steps. She turned quickly down the aisle, and I after her. Once or twice she lingered, and I thought I should overtake her, but again, when, not a second after the door had closed upon her, I stepped out into the street. She had vanished. On the church step lay something white. It was not a flower this time, but a letter. I rushed back to the church to read it, but the church was fast shut, as if it had not been opened for years. I could not see by the flickering shrine lamps. I rushed home, lit my lamp, pulled the letter from my breast. I have it before me. The handwriting is hers, the same as in the archives, the same as in that first letter. To Spiridion Let thy courage be equal to thy love, and thy love shall be rewarded. On the night preceding Christmas, take a hatchet and saw, cut boldly into the body of the bronze rider who stands in the corte, on the left side near the waist. Saw open the body, and within it thou wilt find the silver effigy of a winged genius. Take it out. Hack it into a hundred pieces, and fling them in all directions, so that the winds may sweep them away. That night, she whom thou lovest, will come to reward thy fidelity. On the brownish wax is the device. Amor dur, dur amor. December 23rd So it is true. I was reserved for something wonderful in this world. I have at last found that after which my soul has been straining. Ambition, love of art, love of Italy. These things which have occupied my spirit, and have yet left me continually unsatisfied, these were none of them my real destiny. I have sought for life, thirsting for it as a man in the desert thirsts for a well, but the life of the senses of other youths, the life of the intellect of other men, have never slaked that thirst. Shall life for me mean the love of a dead woman? We smile at what we choose to call the superstition of the past, forgetting that all our vaunted science of today may seem just such another superstition to the men of the future. But why should the present be right and the past wrong? The men who painted the pictures who built the palaces of three hundred years ago were certainly of as delicate fibre, of as keen reason, as ourselves, who merely print calico and build locomotives. What makes me think this is that I have been calculating my nativity by help of an old book belonging to Sor Asdrubali, and see, my horoscope tallies almost exactly with that of Medea da Carpi, as given by a chronicler. May this explain? No, no, all is explained by the fact that the first time I read of this woman's career, the first time I saw her portrait, I loved her, though I hid my love to myself in the garb of historical interest. Historical interest indeed. I have got the hatchet and the saw. I bought the saw of a poor joiner in a village some miles off. He did not understand at first what I meant, 
and I think he thought me mad. Perhaps I am. But if madness means the happiness of one's life, what of it? The hatchet I saw lying in a timber yard, where they prepare the great trunks of the fir trees which grow high on the Apennines of St. Elmo. There was no one in the yard, and I could not resist the temptation. I handled the thing, tried its edge, and stole it. This is the first time in my life that I have been a thief. Why did I not go into a shop and buy a hatchet? I don't know. I seemed unable to resist the sight of the shining blade. What I am going to do is, I suppose, an act of vandalism. And certainly I have no right to spoil the property of this city of Urbania. But I wish no harm either to the statue or the city. If I could plaster up the bronze I would do so willingly. But I must obey her. I must avenge her. I must get at that silver image which Robert of Montemolo had made and consecrated in order that his cowardly soul might sleep in peace, and not encounter that of the being whom he dreaded most in the world. Aha, Duke Robert! You forced her to die unshriven, and you stuck the image of your soul into the image of your body, thinking thereby that, while she suffered the tortures of hell, you would rest in peace, until your well-scored little soul might fly straight up to paradise. You were afraid of her when both of you should be dead, and thought yourself very clever to have prepared for all emergencies. Not so, Serene Highness, you too shall taste what it is to wander after death, and to meet the dead whom one has injured. What an interminable day! But I shall see her again to-night. Eleven o'clock. No. The church was fast closed, the spell had ceased. Until to-morrow I shall not see her. But to-morrow! Ah, Medea! Did any of thy lovers love thee as I do? Twenty-four hours more till the moment of happiness, the moment for which I seem to have been waiting all my life. And after that, what next? Yes, I see it plainer every minute. After that, nothing more. All those who loved Medea da Carpi, who loved and who served her, died. Giovan Fresco Pico, her first husband, whom she left stabbed in the castle from which she fled, Stimiliano, who died of poison, the groom who gave him the poison, cut down by her orders, Oliverotta Danani, Marc Antonio, Frangipani, and that poor boy of the order Laffi, who had never even looked upon her face, and whose only reward was that handkerchief with which the hangman wiped the sweat off his face, when he was one mass of broken limbs and torn flesh. All had to die, and I shall die also. The love of such a woman is enough, and is fatal. Amor dure, as her device says. I shall die also. But why not? Would it be possible to live in order to love another woman? Nay, would it be possible to drag on a life like this one after the happiness of tomorrow? Impossible. The others died, and I must die. I always felt that I should not live long. A gypsy in Poland told me once that I had in my hand the cut line which signifies a violent death. I might have ended in a duel with some brother student, or in a railway accident. No, no, my death will not be of that sort. Death! And is she not also dead? What strange vistas does such a thought not open? Then the others. Pico, the groom... Stimiliano, Oliverotto, Frangipani, Principali degli Odalafi, will they all be there? But she shall love me best, me by whom she has been loved after she has been three hundred years in the grave. December twenty fourth. I have made all my arrangements. To night at eleven I slip out. So as Dubali and his sisters will be sound asleep. I have questioned them. Their fear of rheumatism prevents their attending midnight mass. Luckily there are no churches between this and the Corte. Whatever movement Christmas night may entail will be a good way off. The vice-prefect's rooms are on the other side of the palace. 
The rest of the square is taken up with state rooms, archives, and empty stables and coach houses of the palace. Besides, I shall be quick at my work. I have even tried my saw on a stout bronze vase I brought of saw as Dubali, and the bronze of the statue, hollow and worn away by rust, I have even noticed holes, cannot resist very much, especially after a blow with the sharp hatchet. I have put my papers in order, for the benefit of the government which has sent me hither. I am sorry to have defrauded them of their history of Urbania. To pass the endless day and calm the fever of impatience, I have just taken a long walk. This is the coldest day we have had. The bright sun does not warm in the least, but seems only to increase the impression of cold, to make the snow on the mountains glitter, the blue air to sparkle like steel. The few people who are out are muffled to the nose, and carry earthenware braziers beneath their cloaks. Long icicles hang from the fountain with the figure of mercury upon it. One can imagine the wolves trooping down through the dry scrub and beleaguering this town. Somehow this cold makes me feel wonderfully calm. It seems to bring back to me my boyhood. As I walked up the rough, steep, paved alleys, slippery with frost, and with their vista of snow mountains against the sky, and passed by the church steps strewn with box and laurel, with the faint smell of incense coming out, there returned to me, I know not why, the recollection, almost the sensation, of those Christmas Eves long ago at Posen and Breslau, when I walked as a child among the wide streets, peeping into the windows where they were beginning to light the tapers of the Christmas trees, and wondering whether I, too, on returning home, should be let into a wonderful room all blazing with lights and gilded nuts and glass beads. They are hanging the last strings of those blue and red metallic beads, fastening on the last gilded and silvered walnuts on the trees out there at home in the north. They are lighting the blue and red tapers. The wax is beginning to run onto the beautiful spruce green branches. The children are waiting with beating hearts behind the door to be told that the Christ child has been. And I? For what am I waiting? I don't know. All seems a dream. Everything vague and unsubstantial about me, as if time had ceased. Nothing could happen. My own desires and hopes were all dead, myself absorbed into I know not what passive dreamland. Do I long for tonight? Do I dread it? Will tonight ever come? Do I feel anything? Does anything exist all around me? I sit and seem to see that street at Posen the wide street with the windows illuminated by the Christmas lights, the green fir branches grazing the window panes. Christmas Eve, Midnight I have done it. I slipped out noiselessly, saw as Drubali and his sisters were fast asleep. I feared I had waked them, for my hatchet fell as I was passing through the principal room where my landlord keeps his curiosities for sale. It struck against some old armour which he has been piecing. I heard him exclaim, half in his sleep, and blew out my light and hid in the stairs. He came out in his dressing-gown, but finding no one, went back to bed again. "'Some cat, no doubt,' he said. I closed the house-door softly behind me. The sky had become stormy since the afternoon, luminous with the full moon but strewn with grey and buff-coloured vapours. Every now and then the moon disappeared entirely. Not a creature abroad, the tall, gaunt houses staring in the moonlight. I know not why. I took a roundabout way to the corte, past one or two church doors, whence issued the faint flicker of midnight mass. For a moment I felt a temptation to enter one of them but something seemed to restrain me. I caught snatches of the Christmas hymn. I felt myself beginning to be unnerved, and hastened towards the corte. As I passed under the portico of San Francesco, I heard steps behind me. It seemed to me that I was followed. 
I stopped to let the other pass. As he approached, his pace flagged. He passed close by me and murmured, Do not go. I am Giovan Francesco Pico. I turned round. He was gone. A coldness numbed me, but I hastened on. Behind the cathedral apse, in a narrow lane, I saw a man leaning against a wall. The moonlight was full upon him. It seemed to me that his face, with a thin pointed beard, was streaming with blood. I quickened my pace, but as I grazed by him he whispered, Do not obey her. Return home. I am Marc Antonio van Giapani. My teeth chattered, but I hurried along the narrow lane, with the moonlight blue upon the white walls. At last I saw the corte before me. The square was flooded with moonlight. The windows of the palace seemed brightly illuminated, and the statue of Duke Robert, shimmering green, seemed advancing towards me on its horse. I came into the shadow. I had to pass beneath an archway. There started a figure as if out of the wall, and barred my passage with his outstretched cloaked arm. I tried to pass. He seized me by the arm, and his grasp was like a weight of ice. "'You shall not pass!' he cried, and as the moon came out once more, I saw his face, ghastly white and bound with an embroidered kerchief. He seemed almost a child. "'You shall not pass!' he cried. "'You shall not have her. She is mine, and mine alone. I am Prince Ivali Delio de Laffi. I felt his ice-cold clutch, but with my other arm I laid about me wildly with the hatchet which I carried beneath my cloak. The hatchet struck the wall and rang upon the stone. He had vanished. I hurried on. I did it. I cut open the bronze. I sawed it into a wider gash. I tore out the silver image and hacked it into innumerable pieces. As I scattered the last fragments about, the moon was suddenly veiled, a great wind arose, howling down the square. It seemed to me that the earth shook. I threw down the hatchet and the saw, and fled home. I felt pursued, as if by the tramp of hundreds of invisible horsemen. Now I am calm. It is midnight. Another moment, and she will be here. Patience, my heart. I hear it beating loud. I trust that no one will accuse poor Soraz Drubali. I will write a letter to the authorities to declare his innocence, should anything happen. 1. The clock in the palace tower has just struck. I hereby certify that, should anything happen this night to me, Spiridion Trepka, no one but myself is to be held. A step on the staircase. It is she! It is she! At last! Medea! Medea! Ah! Oh! Amor dure, dure amor. Note. Here ends the diary of the late Spiridion Trepka. The chief newspapers of the province of Umbria informed the public that, on Christmas morning of the year 1885, the bronze equestrian statue of Robert II had been found grievously mutilated and that Professor Spiridion Trepka of Posen in the German Empire had been discovered dead of a stab in the region of the heart given by an unknown hand. <laughs>